this is like a, a really cool tool to like test how you're doing with the supplement. Cause many people have problems with like, yeah, I take a supplement. I don't know what the hell is, is happening to me. Absolutely. And, and not only that, but uh, things that you eat, things that you do can have a huge impact on some of these numbers. Like for example, plasticity, your brain's ability to, to accommodate and adapt to stimuli goes way down if you take certain kinds of drugs, beta blockers, things like that. For people who don't know you with the MicroPulse, um, you know, they, they, let's say this is the first time they're hearing you. Uh, the reason I'm bringing you on is because you're an expert on making these kinds of devices. You're, you're, you're a, a professor of mechanical engineering, right? Biomedical engineering. I used to be a mechanical Bio engineer in Michigan, and now I'm at UNC. I'm a professor of biomedical engineering. Okay, so you're a professor of biomedical engineering. Essentially, you're making medical equipment. You're an expert on making medical equipment for the human body, biomedical. Yeah. But my um, focus is on in-home use super powerful scientific clinical tools that are just affordable, which you can use in the home. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I just want people to get the background where, you know, you're, you're, you're a scientist. Your goal is to create these products. You're, you're not necessarily, you, you, know, you know, you're not just like some kind of white label, you know, you're, you're not like white labeling some kind of tool and then saying it's going to cure everything under the sun. <laughs> you're, yeah, you're, 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 the, you're the one who's actually designing these kinds of devices. Uh, so that you can help the masses and and so for people to be able to use them and and try to self hack and and figure out what kind of issues uh, you, you're you're also trying it seems like you're trying to go some of the traditional route you're trying to get this into the military trying to get some FDA approval three years ago we thought we'd make something really 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 inexpensive that would give you a yes or no answer if you have a brain injury because that was kind of mm -hmm. the question the military was answering. Has this person injured their brain? Yes or no, right? But you can see now we're way past yes or no answers. We're, we're way down in the weeds saying exactly how much. So you get these all these raw scores in that table on the, on the lower right, and it, it gives you much, much, much more insight into, um, into how your brain's performing. And you can use that to kind of dial in like nootropics and uh, behavioral things you're doing, whatever it is you're doing to try to hack your brain. You can really dial it in now. So This is – yeah, this is really cool. Um, I think I think this is cool. I think we might um, integrate this down the road in one of our products that we're building. Um, we want to. So we have a few products that we have now. I, I don't know exactly how much you know. You know about Self Hacked, obviously, right? Yep. That's that's our content website. We release a lot of content. We get a bunch of visitors. We're growing nicely. We get two million people a month. Um, and then we have uh, kind of sister companies where uh, we have you know, Self Decode, which analyzes genetics and tries to give feedback on your genetics. And now, um, May 1st, we're releasing the lab test analyzer, which is gonna take your lab test and give you information on that. We, what we wanna do is we wanna um, develop a digital health coach that kind of integrates all this information. Um, and then we have the content resource like Self Hack, we have the lab test, we got the genetics, we got you know, we're, we're going to integrate symptoms into both self decode and the lab test analyzer. And then um, we have this kind of central feedback tool where people will put in what they're taking and what they're doing. Um, I think a tool like this uh, would be really cool in, in plotting people like, you know, you take a supplement and then you take some of these tests. We might, you know, we might suggest some other tests as well. But I think this is like a, a really cool tool um, to like test how you're doing with the supplement. Because many people have problems with like, yeah, I take a supplement. I don't know what the hell is, is happening to me. Um, I happen to be one, an individual who when I take something, it's, it's like I'm very, you know, substances and, and foods and other things seem to impact me like really strongly. And um, and I do notice, but obviously not to this degree. Like I can't say, oh, my accuracy is down or, or my focus is up or anything like, or, you know, if, even if I was able to do that, it would just be up or down. Not like, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to say like 100% versus 80% or 98%. This, this really quantifies what you're doing. Um, that's the and idea. yeah, yeah, that, that's great. So like, you can test out one thing at a time, how a supplement is doing, how sleep impacts you more or less, how, how a device, you know, uh, people, you know, a lot of people also 
let's say they use ISIS and, and one of the biggest things, how do I know if I'm help if it's helping me or if it's not? Um, you know, well, if you're the person, yeah, uh, the some people, people are ISIS huh? and then, then a lot of people will use our ISIS uh, device on their head and their scores will go right up. If they have wow, one. that's incredible. See, see that's yeah. one of the biggest problems. Um, yeah. People try, yeah, people try a treatment and then they're just like, well, I don't know, like, I don't know if it's helping me or not. And, and some people, sometimes people will say, I don't notice any difference and it actually causes a difference. Some right. people, and then on the other hand, some people might say, yeah, I noticed a difference, but <laughs> it's a placebo or something, right? Right. Um, but you know what? If these scores are improving, then whatever it is, it doesn't matter. It means you're doing better with uh, right. even if it's a placebo, then then great, you're still doing better on it, and and then maybe just take a you know a harmless placebo for the rest of your life or something. But <laughs> right. Um, yeah, a, a, as long as the bottom line is improving, as long as your neurological function is improving, um, and and I'm surprised that how sensitive it is. I I kind of didn't want to spoil the. The, like I, I didn't want to try it out before because I wanted to right. see I wanted to like kind of take users um, in like a first time view of, of how this thing is working at, so that I could see for myself and I'm actually surprised that um, it, it seems like it's more advanced than I would have uh, guessed it to be well we've done um, a lot of work on it and we're continuously improving it you know and so all the software upgrades are all free and they just load right in whenever you plug the thing up uh, you know, whenever you use it and we're adding features like we're adding sort of training features like if you want to work on a specific area like reaction time or whatever. We're actually adding some training into that so that you can actually just work on that and see if just by training you can improve your scores. And that's really good for like elderly people, right, for example, um, because this really is kind of a stress test for your brain. Um, you will see a training effect, right? It's like wow. exercise. Your brain, so it's kind of cool. But you can also use it as just like you said, for guidance of, of you know whatever your intervention is. Like, are you using the right uh, supplement? You know, we had one guy say, you know, I've been taking these brain supplements and it's not changing my cortical metrics anymore. And we're like, well, you know, didn't want to say anything specific to him. He's like, <laughs> all my money on this. And then, and then, you know, our res our 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 response to him was, well, when you find something that does improve, you'll know it. Right? He goes, well, yeah, heck yeah. So he starts looking around at other stuff, right? Um, so that's, yeah. that's the thing. It's going to be different for different individuals because you're going to respond differently. So I'll tell you one of the things I'm most excited about is that Mark Tomerell and I really want to work with you to, to, to start to get this out to self-hackers who are going to take it seriously. And we can really start to see for the first time ever how genetics impacts your sensitivity to different nootropics and different, you know, this is all uncharted territory, but we've got the tools now to do it. Right. So that's so, really cool. Yeah. It's yeah. That, that, cool. That's, now, that's really cool. I, I think, um, uh, I, I think, th I, I think this is a really cool tool. I, I think the, um, I, I think measurement is a really critical piece of information that's missing. Cause until now we just, you know, we focused on, um, you know, what an inter a subjective individual evaluation was. And I think that has some value, but obviously you need uh, an objective tool as well. Well, this and, is the thing, so that you're not kidding yourself, right? I mean, so you can say, well, these are the numbers. You know, this thing's right. helping me. This thing's not doing anything. This thing's hurting me. So you can make much more intelligent decisions. A hundred percent. And then, you know, and, and, and there's other, you know, that you could use, I mean, this, this, I would be curious about like, um, I mean, this could go really deep in terms of like what this is, me what it's not measuring as well. I'm sure it's not measuring everything possible, right? But it seems like it's a good, it, it, it's, it's a very start. good, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great start in like, you know, focus, speed, accuracy, time percept, um, fatigue. I mean, I could see uh, it, it measuring all these things and I could definitely see that these things are measuring um, neurological function on various levels. I mean, exactly what kind of neurological change each of them is measuring. Like, so what's happening with focus? Where, where in the brain is that um, change happening when someone's at 100 or 90? Is that the prefrontal cortex? Like which areas of the brain or which regions of the brain? Are, are you familiar with, with those specifics? Yeah, I can tell you about that. And, and, and sometimes it's really important for guidance of treatment. So one of the things I want to send you, and you can just get it from our webpage, is last year we did a study with uh, 
Dr. Bill Pollock, who's an expert on PEMF using our ISIS system on people with uh, in his clinic with uh, brain injuries. And we were able to show massive improvements in all of their cortical metrics over, uh, you know, two to six weeks roughly. Um, but what was quite interesting was it did depend on where you were placing the coils, right? Transtemporally versus transoccipitally. And, and one of the more interesting stories is that some of the people were getting improvements, but not as, as fast as we thought they should. And these were people who had temporal discrimination problems. Well, the temporal mm -hmm. discrimination stuff is done in your cerebellum. So we just recommended that they move the coils front and back so that you, you get stimulus stimulation to the cerebellum and almost instantly their scores just went way better. Because That's just, great. Yeah. So I think like the ISIS device and, and LLLT, those two yeah. kind of treatments you could change to different areas of the brain depending. Precisely. You, Precisely. you know, people will ask me like all the time, hey, I, you know, I got the ISIS, where am I supposed to put it? And it's like, that's a complex question. You, know, yeah, it's, it's you got complex. like, just it's figure it out. I mean, like try different areas and see what works. The problem is it's very hard to do that. Cause like, it's very hard to like, Oh, I tried this area. I think I may have been better on this today or slightly worse. It's really hard to zone in on that. But when you but have this device, yeah, you kind of, track of what you're doing, you go, well, that sort of helped. That helps. Whoa, that's a huge positive, you know, maybe putting it on top of it, your head helps more. And you can exactly. I, I think like um, uh, taking some notes. Uh, can you take notes on this thing, or, or you, you, you know, do it? All? I don't know, but that would be a really good feature. So let me let me sort of tell you how we deal with this, right? So you know, the M1 model for the ISIS is based mm -hmm. a lot on your feedback on my original technology, as well as feedback from many users and, and, and people who who read Self Hacked. So that product really was kind of focused in. For self hackers, and what we're, what we're proposing, yeah, it is, it's, and it, I think it's a much better product for it. And everybody loves it, even if they're not a self hacker, because it has all these features that that your readers really want it, and you want it. So what yeah. I'm proposing is that, like, when you give us feedback for something just like that, hey, can you take notes and can you know what was going on or what different thing you changed? The answer is, yeah, we would we would incorporate that into this, you know, the self hacking. It might not go into the clinical model, but it would go into the self hacking model. So the irony would be. You want to have the self-hacking version of this, which is the least expensive, but it would give you the most features. You know, once something's FDA approved, you can't really improve it a lot. You know, it's, it's once it's FDA listed, you can't change it a lot. But if it's just, you know, self-hacking, kind of self-experimenting stuff, what we're proposing is is to work with you and, and your readers to to really dial this in as the premier self-brain hacking, neurohacking tool. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I think this is, I think this is great. Honestly, I didn't want to uh, promote any kind of products until obviously I try it out on myself and, and see what it's like. So I haven't been promoting this product at all simply because yeah. I wanted to see what it was like. And then just tons of things like just came up and I, I just didn't have the time. And then it got close enough. I was like, you know what, I'll just do this with uh, Dr. Dennis on the podcast. And we'll, you know, let, let's see, I'll see how it is on the, on the podcast. And, um, yeah, that's about as honest as it could possibly be because I know you hadn't <laughs> really tried it before, right? So, so I was kind of concerned you were going to be, you know, talking to me and fumbling with it and everything. But <laughs> this is a really good result for all of the other junk you were juggling in your, in your environment. And yeah, you know, yeah. No, I, I, I'm definitely going to start using this and I, I think it's, um, uh, it's super critical. I, I think I'm a rare breed in, in terms of, uh, you know, being able to know for myself what, what helps and what doesn't, but not on this level, definitely not on this. So if, if definitely for other people, I think it's really critical that they, whenever they try something out, they really have to use some kind of feedback tool. And right now looking at this, I think this is definitely like per the time spent, right? It's like, how long did we spend? 10, 15 minutes? Um, yeah. you know, you and, and, and installing it is like a minute or something like yeah. that. It, it doesn't take long. Um, so like you just going MRI, through, you'd spend 45 minutes and it wouldn't tell you anything. Right. Exactly. Like, <laughs> and, and people are doing like these, the, the, there's a, a test called the NeuroQuant and, 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 you know, people are spending like $1,500 on this thing and, uh, and they're, they're getting information that it was kind of like they'd get anyway and it's hard to know what to do. Like you'd have to like take it every day to see what is changing that measurement. Just, just knowing like, you know, anyone who's taking that, that test that it's kind of like a, it, it's an MRI, but they look for it's, it's, they have software that looks for more nuanced stuff. Right. Um, 
But anyone taking that test obviously has a problem. And then so you know, once you take it, it's like, yeah, I see there's a problem. Um, but you don't even know what to do about it. So I think you're, 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 you just wasted $1,500 because you have no idea what is helping you now unless you take it every week. And, and even every week is tough. This you could take, you know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes a day. Uh, you don't even have to take the whole test, let's say, if you're weak on something um, and yeah. you see it has a big, uh, let, let's say for me, focus is 100%, right? Um, I have yeah. these things that are 100%, but I see speed is my weakest link here. And, yeah. um, you know, if, if I want to see what, how can I increase my speed, this is going to be a good tool to help me figure that out. I don't necessarily have to take every single test. I mean, I think it's good to take all of them just to, you know, see, uh, cause if something helps my speed, but it, it decreases my focus or, you know, it causes me to be more fatigued or whatever it is. I, I don't think that's going to necessarily be a good thing. So, uh, I think definitely you need something that, that is testing neurological function, but you can repeat it every day. Um, like, you know, it, it, it should take 15 minutes, um, or less, and then I think, and I think this is a really good tool. You could also download all these results on a spreadsheet. I see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the data. Yeah, is that's cool. And then you also have this graph here that 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 takes you uh, through time. I, I think I, I think um, you know you designed this program with a, a nice interface. Uh, the, 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 this interface is good with the image showing. Um, you know, what is this? Uh, one, two, three. It's a hexagon. It's a radar uh, showing. Yeah, which all these things that you're, uh, you know, all these things, like it's just a very cool snapshot. And then uh, you can check each one and see how you're doing with time. Um, uh, you know, for now, you can't put notes on there or anything, but I think like it's very easily easy just to download it or, or to take notes on your own. Something I want to do, um, and, and I think this would be a really cool tool, it, it, part of the digital health coach project. We haven't started working on it yet. Just we, we, we kind of just developed the design for it a little, but we haven't really started development on it. Um, reason being is because we wanted to integrate it with first the genetics and lab tests and symptoms. We needed those things to come online first. But I would say in, um, uh, we'll probably start working on it in, in one to two months. Um, you know, maybe like two months where uh, we we're taking everyone's information and then we're also taking their subjective feedback and then we can also use this tool. I would want to, you know, uh, have some kind of API connecting this tool with, um, with our, with our tool so that somebody takes this test. It's like they, they could put in, they take the supplement, they take the test, the information automatically gets downloaded onto our software and then we could, you know, then all the information is on there. Like, okay, here are your genetics, here are your lab tests, here is um, how you've done after you took X supplement or, or some, if you're an athlete, it's like, okay, well, um, how do I, perf how, how am I performing on this test the next day or the same day? Uh, you can try both um, when you just exercise for three hours, right? Is that yeah. hurting your performance or improving it? I think a lot of people tend to overtrain if they're like competitive athletes and they might be hurting their performance. Whereas some people are not exercising at all. And then, you know, you could check, okay, uh, exercise, how's that doing the same day, the next day? Am I, what am I improving on? Um, and I think that's really important. Even, even if you know, like, okay, exercise is healthy. Um, but how, what does it exactly improve? What, what am I improving? I think when you know what it improves, then you're much more motivated to do whatever that treatment is, right? If there's kind of this fog of like, I, you know, I kind of feel a little better on it, you know, whatever. It's like, okay, and I know it's healthy, but it doesn't really give you that motivation. When you know, it's like, well, my speed improves. Um, I, I was doing some kind of test, not with this device, but I'm going to start using this. Uh, just, just like a cognitive test that measures my speed. And what I noticed is that having carbs, like from honey, um, because I, I tend to react in, in somewhat negative ways to other carbs, but like having carbs from honey and um, uh, certain carbs that don't cause me to react like high maize, uh, I noticed that my speed improves. Like one test, I was just like bombing on the speed. And then I, I was like, I didn't have carbs that day. And I'm like, you know, what, let me just drink carbs. And all of a sudden my speed dramatically improves. Those are the uh, kinds so, of things you're going to see. That's for sure. Yeah. So, um, because not everybody's going to respond that way. 
Exactly. Some people might respond worse to any kind of carbs. They might, uh, you know, it could, it could maybe even increase speed, but decrease, uh, increase fatigue as well. And, and then you'd want to see like, okay, how much is it increasing fatigue? How much is it increasing speed? Is that a good trade off? Um, so these things are quite complex. And I think having a simple tool, very simple tool like this, the brain gauge, where it's really just like a, it looks like a mouse and you put two fingers on it and then you could see exactly what your deal is in 15 minutes. I think this is really critical. Um, and I think it's going to be really cool to use this uh, with our digital health coach so that you can see like, okay, here are my lab results. Uh, and, and, and once we get enough data, we could start trying to correlate like maybe uh, your speed has is correlated. We notice people with slower speed um, having this gene or this lab result, right? That would um, be really interesting and really helpful for humanity in general, right? Because it's largely unexplored because this tool hasn't existed. Exactly. Yeah. And so, and then it's like, once you know the gene or, or uh, some kind of lab test that, that is impact that, that has a correlation with speed, then you can, then you know where to look. It's like, cause another problem people have is like, okay, let's say they have this tool, which is great. And then they start with supplements. There's like, you know, thousands of different kinds of tests that they can experiment on themselves. It could take years. Some people are like, I want to, you know, I want to know right now what, it, like the best, what's the number one thing I can take right now um, that that's like the most likely to increase my speed? Well, if you're having this gene, let's say, or this lab result, um, then, and, 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 you know, there's some kind of, you know, like uh, there's a correlation and then you could, you know, we could also like look into it and see like, Hey, this gene has something to do with mental processing or whatever it is. Uh, then that's like a really good, uh, and then, then for every gene, really, you have a bunch of substances which could increase the expression of it or decrease the expression, right? And you could start hacking in that way. Well, exactly. So that gene may affect your brain directly or it might affect your metabolism, right? Correct. A hundred percent. Then you can use this as a, as a measure for, well, okay, how's this metabolic thing or this immunologic thing actually in fact impacting my uh, medical function, my brain function? A hundred percent. I think, I think a part of the problem, we were missing a lot of different elements, even just a couple of years, like 10 years ago, we didn't, I, I think the number of treatments uh, that, that, that have gone onto the market have increased exponentially, like, especially natural treatments. I remember like uh, 15 years ago, it was hard to get supplements. It, like there weren't right. that many supplements on the market. Now it's just exploded. You're like every ingredient you could ever want is like somebody selling it, <laughs> right? right. Um, the and then, is what to do, and it's really hard to tell sometimes, right? Yeah, exactly. And then also when it comes to the genetics, like nobody had their genetic sequence, um, and so that's why I think a tool like Self Decode comes in, right? We analyze your genetics, and and we're 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 investing a lot of resources into that. And then now the the other problem that I see is like. Uh, okay, how do I test this? You know, how do I know X, Y, Z is working for me? I think this is a, a great tool to do that. And then people are like, well, where do I start? You know, uh, how do I know what to start with? They want to just like, give me, you know, tell me something to start with. Because when they're reading self-hacked, it's like an encyclopedia almost. They're like reading through all this information. Like, how do I know what applies to me? That's why I started trying to develop software to, uh, simplify that process. I mean, it's something that, you know, you don't do overnight and, and it's, it's a very, it's a long-term project. Same with, with this, you know, over time, this tool gets better. And, and I noticed even from a year ago, I, I tried it slightly. I didn't even try all the uh, things. I just tried like, you know, just to see what it was. And then I, I and I, I just noticed uh, the, the program definitely got a lot better. Yeah, it's, um, it's gotten better and it'll continue to get better. And, and one of the ways that we want to make it better, though, is one of the reasons it's so much better is that a few years ago, we had tested a few, you know, hundred people. And now we've got like 10,000, I think. So we got wow. a lot of people in the database. And so it's actually this relational database that allows us to look at how, 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 how vast different classes of people really do things, right? So, you know, I've talked to my, you know, the co-developer of this, Mark Tomadol. Hopefully, you'll get a chance to interview him someday, but... But we think that the, the, the next big step here 
is that now that the hardware, the technic, you know, the technical part of it, the, the analysis software, which is very complicated, it's like three and a half million lines of code actually. Oh wow. Yeah, it's really sophisticated. This is a, like a really complex, a multi-dimensional, you know, analysis to figure out what these numbers are. It's not just like adding and multiplying. Right? There's really something to it. But we think the big advance is going to become when a bunch of people take it seriously and, and test themselves and then correlate that with their genetics, their behavior, their diet, right? And and that's what's going to really help people. So it's sort of like almost like a decode your brain kind of thing, right? It's like like you, you could see how that would fit in perfectly. And so I've, I'm familiar with the things you're doing. So I've explained it to my, my colleagues. And they're like, yeah, that's a perfect place to use this tool because it's going to be interesting and useful for like the military. And it's going to be useful for doctors. They'll be able to say, yeah, you kind of bumped your head, you know, don't do that for a while. Right. But the people who are really going to benefit from this are self hackers where are looking at the nuanced changes and they're asking the kinds of questions that you ask and how does that relate to genetics and behavior and supplements and, and you know all these things and it's and it's a huge unexplored territory and i can tell you something nobody at the nih can do that kind of research because they don't have the tool unless they're using ours we actually work with a lot of researchers but they don't have the tool and they don't have the other kind of half of what you have which is this other vast amount of information to to integrate with it yeah i i think i i really think a lot of things are coming together now and i think once um once you get, you know, once there's a ton of people, like once we get a lot of data with the genetics and the lab test, I think the lab test analyzer is going to be um, our best tool to date. I basically, you know, I learned some, I, I think like user experience is really critical and, and it's something that I didn't, um, it's much harder to do with genetics because genetics is really complex and, and people just want quick answers, right? And it's not something that's quite there right now. But lab tests are actually a lot easier because there's a finite number of lab tests. There, you know, with genetics, there's like millions and millions of SNPs, right? Um, and then other aspects of someone's genetic code. Uh, with lab tests, there's like, you know, how many? 500 lab tests. Um, we could have the microbiome as well. Something like, you know, testing someone's microbiome and then looking at, um, you know, what, what aspects of the microbiome could have to do with these things. Or, uh, you know, like I said, lab tests or genetics. Uh, I think these. Th this is going to really take uh, self-hacking to the next level. And uh, as the company develops, um, we have more and more resources to just plow back into these kinds of tools. And um, I, I think the ecosystem of these kinds of tools is what's critical. If you just had, let's say, this tracking tool, you know, it has some use on its own. But if you didn't have, if you only had like, if you didn't have any supplements or or equipment to use and experiment, then it's really just like, okay, how much sleep did I get? Um, what did I eat today? Uh, and how much exercise did I do? I mean, there's there's a limited number of variables. But So you need kind of like a lot of uh, potential treatments. And then you also need um, good software to, uh, you need something to tell, give you feedback in how you're doing. And then you need good software uh, for lab tests and genetics to kind of uh, bring in a, a whole bunch of data that you know a doctor wouldn't just be able to do on their own They can't you, you know as a doctor That's you right. can't look through someone's raw Genetic code and like look at a million snips. It's not and feasible really right? correlated with other people's data either That's the problem. So like because of HIPAA and all these other things, when, you know uh, in a clinical setting People there's a really restrictive but if you're doing like a self-hacked community where everybody's saying, you know, like, let's share information, you can de-identify it so no one person is. Oh, 100%. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, the, it's going to hit a critical threshold once, like, you know, once you have a bunch of people within the ecosystem, like, try, they, they have equipment to measure like this, uh, how they're, you know, how they're responding. They have, um, they have the software tools, they have their genetic sequence, they have a bunch of lab tests. Lab tests are also getting cheaper as time go, goes on. Right. And I think that's and, also and another right critical factor. Remotely. You can do a lot huh. of this stuff remotely, right, yeah. So, yeah, so I remember is, like 15 years ago, um, like trying to get lab tests, each lab test was like a ton of money. So you want to get this lab device, test? I mean, yeah, insurance paid for it, but I, I think like we're moving to, uh, I, I, you know, it, and it's also heavily regulated, so it's still expensive. But I think we're moving. I think as time goes on, there, you know, these things are getting cheaper. Um, not as cheap as I would like. I, th I think there's much more to do on that front. But 
I, I think over time there's definitely uh, an indicator that the, that that um, uh, the, these lab tests and and definitely genetics. Genetics is getting dramatically cheaper. I think yeah. like um, next year soon you'll be able to sequence your whole genome for like five hundred bucks. Yeah. And um, you know uh, at that point. Uh, like we're we're actually preparing to uh, analyze the whole genome sequencing. I mean, it, it's actually a big task because like each file could be like ten gigabytes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you're when you're dealing with whole genome sequencing, it's a lot of data, and then you know parsing all that data. It's actually a complex thing, which is why nobody has like a solid full genome analysis tool yet. Um, but that's something we started developing because we want to be on the ground floor. But um, I think definitely the whole ecosystem of products is is going to be a really uh, foundational change, and and it's not really going to take that much time. I, th I think like you know connecting, um, and, and I think even like tools like um, you have a, you know tools like Alexa, you can interact with it, and they have their API. Like you know, uh, you know eventually down the road, we want, might want to build a tool that integrates as well with that. Um, the Amazon Echo, let's say, where, you know, you could say like, it could it could tell you based on all the it, data that you're inputting what you should try to eat today, right? And then you take the test at the end of the day and you see, okay, uh, and then we kind of compute that data for you. And then once you have like, you know, half a million people giving you their data, the amount that it, it, that's a real treasure trove of what you can then, you know, give back to the consumer and then say, here's what you should try next, because based on our data you know, 10,000 people have taken this and their uh, focus has increased, right? Well, and this so, is the next level yeah. of the feedback, right? So, so not only are you giving feedback to this individual, but then you've also got data on that individual, uh, you know, de-identified, so you're not, like, giving any Of course, yeah, right. Away, but you've got the, this core data that's really impossible to collect any other way, um, you know, on their genetics and on their, on their diet and their behavior. And then you're feeding back into our system. And our system is a really sophisticated relational database that can that can start to to, to help with an, you know the analysis of these kinds of things too. And then so I can absolutely see where you could have a button right on this would be like the you know the self hacking version of Brain Gauge, right? And you press a button that says upload to self hacked. You know, so right? Ex yeah, yeah I, I think whatever data yeah. they want to share with you, there it goes, right? And then you can use that. And then the great thing is that about our product and technology here, every single person who uses it makes it better, right? A hundred percent. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing with with our tools. Like uh, the more people who use it, the more data we'd have, and then the yeah. more we can try to predict what the person will do well with. So I think, yeah, I mean, you know, after, like just getting into this conversation, I, I realized that um, we probably need to speed up that digital health coach tool. Um, just because I'm, I'm looking at you know, this kind of tool that we have here is, is simple enough to use. And I think it's, it's good enough that we can really get great data. Um, I'm going to, you know, after this call, I, I mean, in general, over the next couple months, I'm going to definitely be in touch with you and, and your team um, to try to integrate these tools so that uh, I, I think this would be a, a very good tool. This is probably going to be the first, external integration tool. I mean, you have things like Fitbit or whatever, you know, how many steps you've walked, but it's not anything close to this kind of feedback, right? Actually, like, I'd like to tell you something about that. We just wrote a scientific paper, Mark Tomerdahl and I did, on the, on the basis of using these other interface devices, smartphones, mobile devices, regular commodity-grade computer mice and stuff like that. And there are many scientific papers that are, that are really down on those things because they can't really make accurate, repeatable measurements. They're not scientific instruments. They're really I agree. just an interface. I device. agree. That's, that's why, I, you know, people, I, I haven't been able to recommend anything to date because people are just like, well, how do I know this is working? And it's like, I don't know, you know. Um, like there's some, even the sleep devices, there used to be a sleep device that, that wasn't very accurate, um, like telling you how you slept that day. I mean, I mean, even if you did want to use these devices, some of the, let's say Fitbit, if you wanted to use something like, you know, tracking how many steps you did, or let's right. say even however accurate it was for your sleep, uh, you could still upload it into our, right. you know, into, into our system. And, and, and that will tell you like, um, like, yeah, and then you could, and then you could take these tests and see like, okay, how many steps did I take today? How am I doing on 
on, on these measurements like focus, speed, fatigue, and things like right. that. Well, can I actually show you some numbers using the test that you have up right now? Let me tell you how good it can be and how bad it can be, right? So look at RT, that's reaction time variability. So your score is 17.5, right? Okay. Which is, is sort of like your variability is about 17.5 milliseconds. Well, a device can measure down to less than a millisecond and less than a micron of displacement, less than a millionth of a meter, less than a millisecond. So we can give you that number and it's really accurate. And every time you take wow. the test, the number we give you is going to be really accurate. So trivia question. If you just use one of these like, you know, test your brain software things that's on a, on a computer with a mouse, the, rea the variability just built into the hardware of that measurement is 30 to 50 milliseconds. So your variability is down in the noise of the hardware, just the computer hardware. Wow, that's, a, that's number, crazy. But it's crap, it's just nonsense. Because there are a number they can't, and this is, this is actually published scientifically. And in fact, there's a guy in Britain, his last name is Plant, he's been publishing papers on this for about, since about 2003. And as computer hardware gets like simpler and less expensive, the ability to measure those precise performance parameters actually goes down. Right, and then when you add a network in, or you add a touch screen in, just you'd never believe this, but it, that a touch a touch screen alone adds 100 to 200 milliseconds of variability in to your reaction time measure. Oh so, wow, hey, that's unbelievable! A, it'll give you a number, but the number is totally unreliable. It's it's you can't do anything scientifically with it. And so, like you know, people who know about these things, I'm a scientific instrument designer. I mean, this is what I do for a living. You know, those numbers are rubbish, and we went way over the top to make sure these numbers are really precise and repeatable. So, so you can, you really can say things about these numbers because they mean something scientifically. I didn't realize that, 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 that was there. That was such a big problem in uh, like, let's say something like reaction time, the hardware itself uh, that's just was an example. Well, nobody yeah. saw a Fitbit or a smartphone or anything is going to tell you, Hey, look at all the things our stuff can't do. <laughs> right. <laughs> So they want they give you a colorful display. It's got nice, easy to use interface. You think, whoa, you know, my reaction time variability is like you know eighty seven milliseconds. Well, it's adding fifty or so on top of what yours really is, which is much smaller than the variability in the interface itself. So you've got to. This is why you've got to really have hardware that's specifically built for the task. And the cool thing about the brain gauge is it's a it's it's about fifty sixty thousand dollars worth of scientific hardware. That would take up, you know, a shelf, compressed down into a mouse, that costs about four or five hundred bucks. That's what. Wow, that's unbelievable. So let's get into some of the. Uh, now that it, I, I wanted to get into some of the, I, I guess we got into the nitty gritty first, as like how to use it, what it's telling us, uh, you know, and, and what people can use it for. Let's get into uh, some bigger topics, like, um, uh, like how it's interacting with the brain, like how your neurological function is because you know in some ways it could seem weird that i mean i once you use it i, I feel like it makes sense because you, you're doing all these like uh nifty things like you know um uh in like i could see why it's testing for all these things but how is your neurological can, can you explain some of the mechanisms yeah. by how yeah, so me, you know you have these yeah show people this is what it looks like it looks like a computer mouse right and it's got two little dots on it that are that are where your fingertips go and so the reason that this works really well, people have known since about the 1950s with these experiments at Hopkins and Harvard, that somatosensory testing, the sensation of touch, is a much, much better way to measure your brain function than vision or hearing or anything else. Because vision and hearing, they're kind of like turning on the whole brain all the time. You can't really separate things, right? But this fingertip corresponding to this button corresponds to one point on your brain. If you see something, it's touching your brain at 8 or 10 or 12 points before it even gets to the visual cortex. But there's a very, very high fidelity connection between your, your skin and your somatosensory cortex. So right here, this one point on this one finger goes to this one point on the brain. This other point on this other finger goes to an adjacent point on the brain. So unlike any other kind of testing, the cortical metrics device, the brain gauge, lets you literally stimulate two precise points on the brain and then see how those two points interact, right? You saw it with time and amplitude and frequency and, and, and you know, these kinds of things. So once you're stimulating just those points on the brain, then you can bring in other cortex functions. Like your cortex has six different layers 
where it's got different, uh, uh, you know, um, different synaptic types of connections with neuro, different neurotransmitters, right? So mm -hmm. some of them are inhibitory, some of them are excitatory. That, so these different layers in the cortex, it's not just a map on the surface of the cortex, but it's in depth, right? So we can use a stimulus at one point on the somatosensory cortex. The, I think the best example is to call in a timing function, which is going to be in your cell, cerebellum at the back of your head. So what it's doing is it's forcing your, a specific point on your brain to access different functions in different locations of the brain at different cortical levels. And that's what those tests are doing. And that's why all of a sudden it feels like, well, this is kind of complicated because it's pushing that signal through different connections in your brain using different mechanisms and different processing things in your brain are working differently. The other thing that's really interesting about somatosensory testing is that somatosensation is the only sense that is actually complexed with pain. All your pain receptors, you know, they, they talk to things in your somatosensory cortex. So when you're studying pain and its effect on the brain, which we can measure, right? Um, the somatosensory cortex is the only game in town. You don't have, you know, pain processing in your, in your visual cortex and things like that. So for that reason, directly accessing through your fingertips specific points in your somatosensory cortex lets you have this really, really powerful, very high fidelity tool. So like three years ago, you know, Joseph, when I was talking to you about this, we were like, you know, yeah, we sort of knew that. So let's go ahead and see if we can make something that's better than a toy that works pretty well. But we started using it for testing like a dozen different things in the brain, autism, Alzheimer's, you know, we can, we can actually measure the effects of different types of antibiotics that aren't even wow. supposed to cross the blood brain, like fluoroquinolones. We can easily detect the effect of that on your brain function, uh, beta blockers and stuff. So about th about the time I talked to you three years ago or so, we really made a, a decision, a conscious decision, like, hey, man, we're sitting on something that is by far the best brain testing technology. We just need to, we just need to run with it. So it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that it's something like a thousand times more sensitive for measuring brain functional tests than any other kind of imaging or EEG that you can do. But people have to understand, we're not generating a brain map that's an image of the brain. We're doing a functional map of the interconnectivity within the brain, calling different functions in different ways to see how your brain is talking to itself and to see how well those different functions are working. That's, that's amazing. I think that's a really uh, concise explanation of what's, what it's doing. I, and that, that helped me understand like the mechanics of it. You basically have this, these two points in the brain, the somatosensory cortex, and that is interacting with all the other parts of the brain um, that are testing for these different things like, you know, time, uh, uh, speed and other things. And it's like, you know, how fast can it go from the somatosensory cortex throughout your brain to your the, the speed center process it and then go back and that it's, is that's telling how fast right it's it's like you may be feeling something but then there we can test neuroplasticity too i don't know of anybody else who can do that and we can test neuroplasticity really fast like we can actually see the effects in in really short periods of time on your plasticity so using your your somatosensory cortex and then having these points interact we can tell you how quickly your brain is adapting to a certain signal and sort of like habituating to it. Like, you know, yeah, okay, I see that signal and I'm starting to ignore it. In some cases, your brain will actually focus on a signal. Like, like if you look at a point on your brain, the stimulus might, you know, as a function of space along your cortex might look like this. And with stimulation, the peak will get higher and narrower. So it's like your brain focuses in and it can do this in a fraction of a second. It can focus in on like um, a specific type of stimulus. Like if a wasp lands on you, you can focus in on it like right away, but not everybody can do that, right? And people who have wow. different kinds of disorders, they can't, they don't have the plasticity to focus in on certain stimuli and then ignore other stimuli. Like people who have, you know, autism, they oftentimes they just can't shut things off, and so their neuroplasticity isn't working right. We can measure all of this. In that's fact, that's super that's interesting. Cool. Like um, when it comes to focus, you might think it's something like simple, but it actually is yeah. using a lot of different processes to. That's right. Uh, to filter out the, the noise from the signal. And I, I actually read a study that one of the um, biggest impacts on IQ, let's say, is that ability to 
filter out the noise from the signal, right? Um, because that's what it is. Like when, when you're, you have all this, uh, like when you're trying to figure something out, you have all this data and then you have to be able to hone in on something, filter out the distractions and then like kind of figure out, you know, go deep into uh, an idea or something like that and, and, and try to filter out some, you know, because there's so much extra stimuli in the brain and your brain is working on filtering all that stuff out. If your brain is not working that well, the filtering mechanism mechanisms also start to go down and then there's That's too much exactly noise. Right. That is precisely correct. And so like a healthy brain is actually really good at filtering out signals and then starting to ignore them. Whereas a person with a certain types of brain injury can't do that as well. So interestingly, using the brain gauge, a person who's got an injury will actually do better on certain tests where we're trying to trick them because they haven't filtered out. We, you know, we try to get people, you know, we'll, we'll try to actually get their filters to start working. But if that filter's not there, you feel the same stimulus. So a person with a brain injury actually will do certain types of performance, not the ones we report, but certain subsets of the measurements will actually be much better. But that means that their plasticity is much worse. And that's why right. we have to analyze it that way, right? Their filters are, their filters are shut off, so they can, they can actually – tell the differences between stimuli really well. And that ability doesn't decay over time. You, you know, something, something I, uh, interesting that I realized when people have like a lot of, like the brain is really central to so many different processes. So, you know, even something like uh, tinnitus is, is really a, is a, is a brain issue as well, right? It, it's like... Um, Chronic pain is another one. And, and yeah, focus. pain is another, right. Pain is, is, you know, you might think, well, I got pain in X, Y, and Z areas, but... A lot of that is actually coming from the brain sometimes. It's, it, people with like neurological disorders, um, they have like sometimes different symptoms. Sometimes it could be hearing. Sometimes the, the, uh, the you know, light is too bright for them. Noises right. are too loud for them. They can't filter through information or um, other kind of external stimuli as well. Right. And I, I think like, you know, you, you would ask, how are all these things like connected there is a neurological component to all these things and, um, you know, filtering out these kinds of signals or, or if your brain can't uh, dim or adjust to how loud a sound is or, uh, you know, like, like different aspects like that, then that is going to impact some sensory function. That's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And let me tell you why this kind of a measurement is so powerful, right? So that kind of gets complexed into those kinds of inabilities to, to have plasticity and adaptation get complexed into a person's behavior. So say they, you take a drug for autism that, that corrects that problem, usually at like a neurotransmitter level. It still takes many months for their behavior to change, even though their brain function has changed within a few days because you made a correction or a change, right? So we can actually detect in a few days the changes in the cortex function at those levels, right? But you can't detect them behaviorally oftentimes for weeks or months. So you that, get this. That's a really, feedback. yeah. We, that's we, a really amazing point. Um, there, there's some subtle changes in the brain that, you know, when, when you're a scientist, you're measuring the end result like behavioral change. Right. When um, you're a behavioral scientist or a psychologist, that's what you're doing. But when you're a brain, you know, system physiologist, we're going right to the source. We're saying, hey, you've made those changes. Now they're going to show up in in other things, behavior and everything later. But right now you've made the change to the brain and that's what we can, that's what we can tell you. That, that's amazing. I mean, cause you know, let's say someone, let's say someone tries a treatment and they're like, you know, nothing, nothing has changed. I don't notice any change. Right. Because they're, they're, tr they're trying to check for their behavior. Right. They might check something external. Like, I don't know, uh, you, you know, and I think that is kind of, like you said, that is a delayed response sometimes. Like first the, the- behaviors are habits, right? And That's and true. Kind of get into the habit of doing something a certain way and then and you're correcting for it. So you're bringing, you're heaping on top of it all of these other brain functions and functions in the body. A hundred percent. really related. Yeah, exactly. So if, what you really want to do is you say, okay, we know at the core, this is a neurological disorder. And we want to know right away, have we fixed it? Do we need to change the dosing? Do we need to change, you know, something else? Can we do it nutritionally as opposed to with a drug, the, you know, or behaviorally? That's a great that's point. That's, that's a really great point. Like a lot of uh, behaviors are habit-based. And even yeah. if your brain changes, I mean, those underlying changes might not, uh, you know, over time. Actually, they'll dominate, right? But it yeah, exactly. Right. But it could take months, whereas – you want to know right away you took some kind of supplement or some kind of, you did some kind of treatment. 
um, you want to know as soon as possible, did this help or, you know, is this making a change? Um, exactly. And, and yeah, things right. like, you know, well, you're not getting a blood test every day. Uh, certain things are, are, are harder to notice over, uh, you, you know, it takes a longer time to notice. And so having something that gives you immediate feedback, I think is, is really important. Um, which are the main conditions? I mean, let, let's just step back a little. We were talking about like how it could be used in every way. I'm just curious what conditions you're testing it out for currently. Well, we started with autism because Mark Tomlin was mostly an autism researcher. And we started being able to put uh, people into different places with different uh, deficits on the autism spectrum disorder, right? So there's different people who have different deficits that respond differently to, you know, development. Some people grow out of certain things, other people don't grow out of other things, right? And so we started to be able to really uh, sort out who had what kinds of deficits and, and these kinds of things. We actually got to the point where we could uh, tell, we, we were working with a company, we could tell them that this company had developed a drug that was really, really effective for about 30% of the population of people with autism, right? But the problem was, well, they wanted a drug that was 100% effective for 100% of the people. But, you know, as you know, I mean, that's kind of stupid. We could say, okay, this 30% of people will respond really favorably to your drug. The other 70%, they're not really candidates. But 30% of people with autism is a huge number, right? So they were too greedy, and they said, no, we want 100%, 100%, which you can't have, right? Because they wanted, they wanted someone to say their drug was working 100% of the time. On uh, yeah, I, I think uh, when it comes to all of these kinds of treatments, I think, um, you know, people are always trying to look for a silver bullet. Like what is, you know, is that 100% cure? There is nothing that is essentially going to be, almost nothing that's going to be 100% cure for any kind of chronic condition, any what kind of complex much condition. More intelligent, right? I mean, what you're trying to do is much more intelligent. You're saying, okay, well, you have these kind of proclivities and you have these kinds of, you know, genetic, you know, you're, you're fundamentally a certain way. So there's a much higher probability that you're going to respond either favorably or not to something. So it's worth you trying it. And then with a brain gauge, for example, for, for, for cortical function, you have the tool to say, yes, in fact, you did make that change. And yes, in fact, it did help with a number or, or maybe it didn't and you need to try something else. Right. And every time we get that data, it's stronger. And so like, you know, a lot of companies, this is why we've kind of gone away from, we don't take any investors at all. You know, you, you've written about this too. You know the deal, like how that works, right? I mean, I'm, I'm with you 100% on that. Because these guys will drive the bus off the road trying to squeeze every penny out of something. What you really need to do is get it individualized. So you can say, okay, now you've got a tool that can tell you whether or not you as an individual are responding. And you can do the things that make the most sense first because that makes it more efficient. But the bottom line is, is it helping you or not? Can you put a number on it? A hundred percent. I mean, that, that is definitely the future of, of health and medicine is, is a, you know, tailoring a treatment to an individual rather than, you know, X clinical study said 35% of people benefit from X treatment, you know, and then obviously like 30% of that is the placebo. So it's like 5% above the placebo. You know, if 5% of people get cured from a treatment, I would say that's a good treatment for the 5% of people. <laughs> the problem is... Better. It's, it's, it's great, right, to begin with. But it's even better if you could just you know, do a quick survey on people and you can identify that 5%. Exactly, exactly. If you know, exactly, if you know which 5% of the people that's going to be in, and, and I think uh, the way you do that is kind of with a, a diverse set of tools, software tools and, and, and the tools that you have, like, you know, let's check your genetics, your lab tests, and, and your symptoms, and then let's check how you're responding to these treatments in a very, you know, in – in a very direct way rather than like, you know, checking for behavior two months down the line. Um, so I, I think like, you know, putting all these tools together, I think is, uh, is really critical in, in um, you know, being able to identify which person is going to respond to which, uh, which treatment modality. And then like, so if you could do that, 5% of people benefiting will turn into, you know, it could be a hundred percent of people trying it because now they know which people are going to benefit from it rather than, you know, give it to everybody and let's see. Now, right now that's the way medicine is practiced essentially or health. Like, you know, Oh, you know, my friend said that this diet worked for them and then they're like, okay, I'm going to try this diet. Well, you know, <laughs> your friend is one person. It could work. It doesn't work for you. Maybe it works. Yeah. It, it, it could work for one out of a hundred people. And your friend is that one person that it really worked for, uh, you know, assuming that it really works. Like 
I'm not a big fan of vegan diets, but I'm not, I don't say that nobody, I'm sure there are some people that do benefit from a vegan diet. And, you know, then there's the other argument. Well, they didn't try this diet exactly in this way. You know, they didn't try the paleo diet in this exact way. That's true. You know, you could always make those arguments that someone didn't try. But I, I do think that some people, even if they tried every diet, there is some people, you know, I don't know what the percentage is. It could be one in a hundred. They do well with a vegan diet. The problem is how do you know who's going to do well with that, right? So what we do is we try to give advice based on what the most people will do with, do well with. You know, if there's 35% the people do well with a paleo diet and, you know, and, and assuming like 30% is the placebo, you know, and then 31% do well with the vegan diet. We got a 5% of people who are doing better with the paleo diet and 1% of people who are doing better with a vegan diet. Um, you still have like, let's, let's say five times the number of people doing better with a paleo diet, but you still, if you're that one individual, you want to know what you should be doing. And I think um, the, the fastest, you know, getting to a hundred percent and predicting 100% is obviously going to be something that's going to be 10, 20 years down the road. But if we could take that number down to like, all right, well now we're like 50% sure that you might do better with a vegan diet, then that's obviously tremendous, right? That, that's cutting the number of experiments someone has to do down from, you know, 100 or whatever, and, and um, really honing in on, on getting better data on what they should try first. I think like some kind of experimentation is always going to be key for the foreseeable future. It's just, you don't want to be like, uh, you know, you don't want to do what I did, which is like, you know, try a thousand things out and then get the 20 things that work best for me. You know what I'm saying? Like not everyone has time or, or the guts to try a hundred, a thousand treatments out on themselves uh, or the money, you know, it's, it's expensive as well. So if you really can hone down on that and then instead of a thousand, it becomes 40. And then, you know, then that's something that it's like, okay, well these 40 are the best shot of working for me. Then you could really just try and, Oh wow, I found five that are really great for me. Um, then that I think is, is tremendous. And, and a big part of that is just getting good feedback, right? And so, 100%. Right? And that, that's it, critical. It fast and accurate and reliable feedback on brain function. So, that, so that, is, that is a critical piece of, of the, the uh, of, of this, you know, just of figuring out in the quickest way what is working best for you. Um, is the, uh, so let's, let's go to the FDA a bit. Is, it, is, is the, the brain gauge device approved, uh, FDA approved for anything yet? Yeah, actually, it is um, the FDA, as you probably know, is is a, is a is a strange beast to deal with. They are really <laughs> make sure that you know that you get the charlatans out, and nobody's making medical claims that are that are false. So, based upon our technology and our device, um, it is now FDA listed as a somatosensory testing device. You know that it can be used by doctors as a diagnostic aid. So a medical doctor, somebody licensed, doesn't have to be an MD, could take our device. They can buy it now from us, and they can say, "Yeah, this is an FDA-approved device. We, we think it's safe. We think it's effective. It gives me some numbers that I can use to help you, you know, get better." And that's that's what it can do. Now that's a that's an expensive device because we we put a lot of time and effort into supporting that person's clinic, and we also have to jump mm. through a lot of FDA red tape. It's so the consumer cheap. version of it is going to be way cheaper. It's than, exactly the same, right. man. It's like the yeah. same. It just doesn't have all the red tape, you know. Cost. It doesn't exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like we don't make any promises. We just tell you it's the same thing as it is. I mean, yeah. Look, the a lot of people hate the FDA, and I think I'm not a big fan of the FDA. Um, they, but they do some I, service. They keep some of the really bad people out. Exactly. They do some kind of service. Um, they keep they keep some of the bad out, but they also keep some of the good out. And yeah. and, and, and I think it, it really is hard to make claims. Like you know, even it, it's it's very hard to know. You know, someone wants to try something out. It's hard to know if this is going to help your condition. It really is truly yeah. hard to know. That's why I call the website self hacked. It's it's not like. We're not saying like this is gonna help 100% of the people. You have to experiment to see. Right. And, and my goal is, and your goal also, is, yeah. is to try to give them the tools so that they can make better decisions about what they should try out first. Get a better idea. Right. Be, you know, we wanna give them better information about what they should try out first with self-hack. Right. 
We want to give them better information on their genetics, what they should try out first, on their lab tests. And then um, you want to give them better information on, 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 on the feedback, like direct feedback, what is helping them directly the most um, so that they could see quickest. You know, and it's like they could try it once or twice and fail fast, if you will, instead of trying something for three months. And then that's what a normal clinical trial is. You try it for three months, you know, you get the data for, uh, you know, 200 people, and then you see if it's, uh, people are being helped beyond the placebo. And even if there's like, you know, five people being helped out of the 200, all right, it's still statistically significant. Let's, you know, right. it's, it's approved now um, right. after multiple studies, of course. Well, the thing is that, that with this good feedback tool, you could do a lot of sort of kind of... Your own clinical trials in a day. <laughs> with an N of one, because that's the person you're trying to work on. Exactly. So you can combine all kinds of things. and you can, It's like you'd never get a clinical trial that, that's really extensive, that really tells you anything, that really looks comprehensively at all these different things you can do. Whereas in an individual, you can do that if you have the tool. So the right. individual might say, hey, if I take these supplements and I do these things behaviorally, I do some other things, that combination works really well for me and I can prove it because I've got some numbers. And that's the, that's the power we're trying to put in people's hands. So I yeah. see the, the future of health and medicine as a self-hacked future where people are, are a lot more informed and intelligent about themselves and they have the tools. So I'm, I'm kind of like a tool maker, right? It's sort of like I make these hardware, software tools and try to get them out there for people so they're affordable. And then you're sort of like a tool integrator, right? Where you're sort of saying, well, okay, you integrate these various tools with big, huge databases of information on the individuals, how those relate to really big databases on a lot of people. And can you pick out what tools are going to work the best for people and how to use them to dial in, to optimize, to self-hack, right? I mean, that's what you A hundred percent. A hundred percent. We're pumped about that. So, you know, so the, the whole philosophy behind Micropulse, my one company, Cortical Metrics, my other company, is philosophically 100% aligned with you. It may, it's going to help the military tell people, yeah, you got hit in the head, you know, right. you don't want to for a while. But, but that's not going to be the big impact. The big scalable impact, which you're interested in, we talked about this, the big scalable impact is going to be millions of people optimizing and, and figuring out how they as different groups and subgroups respond to different things and then having numbers to prove it. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So, uh, I mean, we kind of just went into the podcast, um, you know, just, I didn't even like, I was just like, here, let me try it out. We, we I wasn't even sure we were going to start it, but then I was just starting it. And I was like, all right, we can use this, I guess. Um, we didn't even give a proper introduction and I guess I can insert one in the beginning, but um, right now. The military understands this, so they're really encouraging us to get it out there for commercial sales for this kind of thing, right? Because they know, well, we have a specific need and we have specific, you know, bureaucratic limits to what we can do. So they want us to thrive as a company. So they're like, man, go out there and, and sell them to as many people as you can. For this kind of <laughs> because in the end, it's going to be the military because the military is just a slice of humanity, right? A right. Really, one. And they want to understand, you know, if the different kinds of effects of nutrition and fatigue and everything else on people but the military is really interested in a lot of health issues like breast cancer and all kinds of things that used to just be the purview of the NIH but the NIH has kind of fallen down on really figuring these things out so the military in the last 10 or 15 years has really stepped up with their own medical research programs to uh, to forward this kind of research so they're in a way they're they're really behind us and they funded you know shout out to the Navy they're the ones who funded all this this hardcore you know development in the last three years yeah, I, I think a, um, a, a ton of technologies come out of the military. I mean, like, um, yeah, it, because the military is, is, you know, interesting enough, is willing to take risks with technology, whereas Precisely. people like the NIH are, are much more conservative, right? Yeah. The military is like, we've got 20,000 people with a TBI that don't know what to do. <laughs> we need help right now. Let's just try whatever. I mean, like, they, the military has historically tried, like, you know, the CIA at one point tried LSD, to, you know, for... Well, they don't do those kinds of tests on humans anymore, so they're very... No, I, I, yeah, they don't do... I, I understand that. I'm just saying, like, the, the, the military is, in some ways, much more open-minded to... Well, to they're open-minded, and they're also... Um, they also need results, right? They've yeah. People who are getting really hurt, right? So most of my research on PEMF stuff started, like, 20 years ago, and I did a lot of... I don't know if I told you this, but I was a consultant for DARPA. So I did a ton of work for DARPA, and they're all about like, man, just figure it out. It's really cool. You right, know? right. DARPA exists because of Sputnik, right? So DARPA right. 
DARPA's actual mission, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, their actual mission is what it, they, they came into existence after Sputnik, and their mission is to never be surprised technologically again. So their mission is not to do, you know. Yeah, and, and they're, they're, DARPA is a great agency because they're willing to take technology risks, whereas most of, the, you know, most of the other public funding agencies are not. The like NIH I, yeah, is, is going to fund research that they have a good idea that it might work, but on the other hand, it's not breakthrough. It's, and it's very conservative. And it's not just the NIH, but it's industry too. And let me give you a great example. Self-driving cars. Most people have no idea. 15 years ago, 16 years ago, self-driving cars started as a DARPA project in the Mojave Desert. That's true. Yeah. And a lot of people don't know that, but you know. And when you actually watch it, you know, they'd have like a, a Humvee with all these LiDAR things on it, everything going about three miles an hour and then just uh, fall off the side of a cliff, right? Because it was so crappy at the time. But now you've <laughs> yeah, got like driverless cars. And this all comes out of DARPA because they were just like, man, we know it's a tough problem solve it you know exactly yeah no i mean i i actually forgot about that and yeah. i realize now like 15 years ago there was these darpa challenges on yeah. on youtube or or whatever yeah. like I, I remember seeing darpa challenge videos um like they had the the yearly darpa challenge for self-driving vehicles yeah and i yeah. thought that was super interesting that's where it all started and darpa has started a lot of things they were the ones who thought you know they were the ones when they were arpa started the internet they were like right no that exactly each other right so let's get some university nerds to get computers to talk. And these guys are like, well, why would you want to do that? You know? Right. Yeah, no, it, it's amazing. Some of the, the best technologies. Yeah. So I think like the military in some ways is very forward thinking in terms of technology, and especially so DARPA. The technology that we're, we're suggesting as, as a it really will take off in the self-hacking community started off as a military technology that they just really needed answers. Who, who got hit in the head badly enough? that we need to be right. careful with them. And then they're like, well, okay, we paid many millions of dollars for you guys to give us a yes or no on that one, but run with it. And so they're really, they encourage us all the time. And so our focus, our corporate focus is, is really on the self hacking aspect of it. Then, you know, the FDA approved clinical stuff, that's nice there. It's going to help people. But I think if you look 20, 30 years down the road, it's going to really be the self hacking community that makes this whole set of tools flourish. That's great. So let's talk about the pricing of, of these uh, products. How, how much is the brain gauge for someone to buy? Um, well, and and uh, what are the different kinds of pricing models you have? So, we, we, you know, we're, we're, we have the sort of FDA approved ones and uh, they're sort of in the thousands of dollars and that's at a clinic. And sort of like if you're a medical device, design, device designer like me, you know that there's nothing that measures anything in a doctor's office that's less than $2,000. They don't even right. look at kilometers. hundred percent. So, so that's in the thousands of dollars range, but we get a lot of sort of like all the paperwork and the, you know, things you need to do to support somebody's clinic uh, and to, and to fulfill all the FDA requirements, which is a huge amount of just bureaucratic burden. Right. But we do exactly the same software and firmware and everything. And uh, I think the price on a, on like a personal use brain gauge, you know, is, is under $500 now. That's going to continue to, you know, creep down. But what we would like to do is we'd like to do it sort of exclusively work with, with you that help that self hacked and, and give everybody a big discount that I won't say a number now because that number is going to vary. And it's, you know, it'll, it'll depend upon what we can do, but it'll be really significant. And it'll be, you know, you'll be able to buy 50 or $60,000 worth of brain testing equipment plus all the analysis for just a few hundred bucks. Wow. That's incredible. So, um, yeah, I, I don't, we didn't discuss a single MRI question. Wow. Yeah, no, 100%. Um, I, I, I think this is a, a device. Anyone with who, who's trying to improve their, their brain and trying to test out how different treatments are working, I don't think you can do that properly without uh, some kind of testing. And, and based on, and, and I haven't seen any good testing to date, the testing instrument. I think the brain gauge is, <laughs> is the, is is the best testing measurement that I've, that I found, uh, by far given, um, given the price, given, uh, the simplicity of use, uh, given the technology that's gone into it. I mean, this is, you know, uh, um, the Navy has spent millions of dollars, uh, gave given millions of dollars of grants to Dr. Dennis to be able to research this. And I, th this is not, you know, I, I'm just using it. I realize that it's, uh, it can have, uh, I think it's really useful and I want to uh, actually integrate this into some of our tools, but even before we integrate it, it's just, it's massively useful just using it 
uh, on your own. Helpful, yeah. And, and the thing is that the more we use it, the more helpful it is. And here's something I would like to just reach out to you and ask for help with, right? We are, let me give you an example that I think you will, when you think about this, you'll really realize how important this is. Age-related cognitive decline, right? Well, by the time a person shows up at a clinic where they've got Alzheimer's and it's kind of full blown, there's not much. Oh, it's there. like 20 years later, 10 it's years later. Funny, right? But our yeah. device is so sensitive. We can detect these changes 10, 15, 20 years ahead of time. Amazing. Sure, we haven't proven it yet, but you know, I'm pretty conservative. No, so yeah, I, I could see it. I could definitely see it because it, right. it's testing these very, very subtle things. Very subtle um, things. So then the idea yeah. would be, well, if you could detect it that far out in advance, and then you make corrections. Maybe you're taking vitamin K2 and you're doing a certain kind of exercise, another, you know, nootropics. Can you actually correct, you know, neurodegenerative diseases before they even become clinical? And, well, and almost, and, and, and all of the, I mean, like there's so many neurodegenerative issues. I mean, you have like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you have uh, a lot of autoimmune conditions. Right. Um, all, like basically all the clients I had um, had some kind of neurological basis whether it's chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, right. these have a very strong uh, neurological basis of, of you know, um, a whole bunch of conditions, essentially, even like heart disease, you know, when you have heart disease, your, 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 um, you know, your vascular system is poor. And so that vascular system, guess where that is? That's in the brain also, yeah. right? And, and type two diabetes, right? It turns out they only discovered this in 2011. You probably know it. The brain is actually the only other place besides the pancreas that makes its own insulin, right? And so there's this feedback between the brain and the, and the body, the pancreas, and, and you get these really interesting cognitive changes, these functional cortical. A hundred percent. Oh, yeah. I mean, like how the brain utilizes glucose. If you have diabetes and you're not utilizing glucose in your body well, you're not insulin sensitive, guess where that – change is also going to take place. It's going to take place in your brain, right? Your brain is not either utilizing glucose. Brain, see, what, you, what happens is your brain tries to compensate by making more insulin, and that suppresses some of the, you know, the, the, the reaction that your body has because your brain usually takes precedence, right? It's like the dive reflex, you know, for oxygen and critical things, your brain, you know, glucose, the blood, your brain takes precedence. So this will give a lot of insights into all of these, like, growing, emerging, and, and big already neurodegenerative problems but crucially, if you make small changes early, can you, can you detect it and can you prevent it by putting yourself on a slightly different, gently, gently different course? A hundred percent, yeah. No way the NIH is going to answer that question. It's going to be a bunch of self-hackers who have things. Right. I mean, like, basically the way the NIH would work was like, all right, let's test this for diabetes. Ten years later, we have an answer for diabetes. I mean, and the truth is we're not a hundred percent sure. I mean, I, you know. Even though the technology sounds great, we're, I'm not, you know, we're not 100% sure how, it, how significant it's going to be, like it's going to test for diabetes. Or, well, let, me or, tell you, let me tell you a great example of how that can go wrong, right? You've got the Framingham study, which you know all about, I'm sure, because yeah. of testing all these people who live in Framingham, Massachusetts. And they did a detailed, like pretty much everybody in the entire village sort of signed up for this. And it's you know, tracking every last single thing they eat and how that impacts, you know, cardiovascular disease. I think primarily is what they were looking at, but other things. And they still give really bad, even with all that data after, I think it's been 50 or 60 years now, they still kind of give bad advice, dietary advice. You know, I mean, we get terrible advice. Yeah. Oh, a hundred. Yeah. A hundred. Right. Exactly. So the data is sort of there, but it's, 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 it's. So the, the problem, I mean, the, the problem has always been like, you have all this correlational data, this data that when you have an N equals one, huh? People are afraid to see things, and then you have this this pressure exerted by you know food lobbyists. Well, that's not good data. Exactly, exactly. You exactly. you, you can get rid of all of the external lobbyists, all of the uh, uh, potential issues with research done on many people, um, the epidemiological studies. Every study there is a there is a problem, and yeah. um, I think just the best way. Right before I would say the best way is try it out and see how you feel. But an even better way is try it out and test how you feel. That's the right? right answer. And as many people as you can get to do that, the better. And then you can be like a fair broker and say, well, hey, man, here, here's what it really says. You know, right, exactly. You know, people are always asking me like, hey, should I buy the ISIS device? To, where do I put it? Where does it? And the answer is like, I don't know if you've got Parkinson's exactly where to put it. But guess, and I, and I would just tell them, you know, try it out and see if it works for you. 
But the problem is like, oh, some people say, I don't know, I can't tell right away. I mean, Parkinson's is a complex disease, right? Like, uh, yeah. like you said, like if you do a treatment, it could take months to be able to notice a change in your, because you're not really that attuned to like really uh, y- y- uh, very subtle events. Like I notice people uh, whose like memory is getting much worse. I, like let's say uh, there was an incident where this person once was taking a lot of drugs and his memory was like, he couldn't remember something from like, like he was, he was asking me the same question six times. Right. And I'm yeah. like, dude, you got to stop taking drugs. Like these were, he was taking cocaine and I don't, I don't know what, but I'm like, you got to stop taking these drugs because your memory is terrible. You're asking me the same question 10 times. It's like, what? No, I didn't. You know, like I, I, this is the first time I asked it to you. And I realized like that was one time I realized like, wow, people don't realize what's going on in their brain. And, and the answer, like your perception one of the interesting things is when your brain function is worse, often your perception is also worse. Cause it, that's really it, true. It's really true. That's really true. And it's not just for things with your brain. It's things for your body. Like the funny story I always tell is I went to high school with a guy who used to think the more that he alcohol, he would drink the stronger he would get. Right. <laughs> all the time. So, so just one day we're sitting around drinking beers, you know, illegally because we're in high school. And I said, you know, let's test it you know, start doing bench presses, right? So he'd have a beer, do a bench press, you know, just not exhaust himself. And he, of course, steadily got worse as he got intoxicated. But his perception was that he was getting stronger. Exactly, because the alcohol also decreases your perception. And so... It it alters your perception, totally. And and I've seen that a a couple times also in a clinical perspective where, like, somebody's lab results get better, but they're like, I don't really notice anything. I mean, like, Dude, your inflammation went down. It used to be X, and now it's Y. It just went down tremendously. And right. like, yeah, I guess so. Um, <laughs> but you know, because the body other, is like, it, it's a complex are, system. Well, Even like, if one element gets better out of right. for a treatment, and and that treatment is still good for you, you don't necessarily note it. You don't you don't necessarily perceive it in a day to day thing. Well, here's something where cognitive changes don't necessarily even factor in. Like when, you're, when your blood pressure is too high, over a really wide range, you can't feel it. Exactly, so, exactly. Yeah. But guess what? Your, your brain function will actually probably decline if you have right. very high blood pressure. But you can also measure your blood pressure to see, oh, this exercise is helping or it's not. So a measurement of blood pressure is oh, much more powerful. That's a great pressure. point. That's a great, you know, like th- this guy was telling me the other day, oh, yeah, my blood pressure is like 190. And it's yeah. like, Dangerous. yeah, I was like, I was, I was like, what you, you, and he's like, yeah, now I use a blood pressure cuff and I could see what treatments are helping me. Like how X is like, I was like, I was thinking though, if your blood pressure is 190, like there's shit going on in your body that you really should notice, but he just wasn't. A lot of people don't. And that's why they call it the silent killer, right? So people walk around with this blood pressure, you know, through the roof, but they don't, they don't perceive it. So you got exactly. To- Measurement. And so that's the, that's one of the things we tell people about the brain gauge is it's a lot like taking your blood pressure. It can give you an overall sense for the health or non-health of your cardiovascular system. Brain gauge can give you a very good multi-dimensional sense for the health or overall non-health of your brain. And you have to have numbers like that to be able to tell whether or not you're in a problem zone and then whether or not what you're doing is healthy. A hundred percent. And in even, you know, even me with a, you know, very uh, exquisite, I, I think I'm like very attuned to what's going on in my body. Sometimes it could take a while. Like you don't know exactly what's going down. You might notice like general sense of decreased cognitive function, but you don't know exactly what's going down. And like, you know, you don't, it's, it's really very hard to determine. Um, and that's why I think like, you know, obviously someone with Alzheimer's is going to know 20 years before um, like, I remember my grandmother, she, her brain started going down like early on. Um, yeah. And then like they only, they, you know, we, we were able to see she was just repeating herself all the time, telling the same story 20 times a day. And when she was like 60 and like she only got diagnosed with dementia when she was like 90. And according to her, her brain was functioning at peak capacity. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's right. She just didn't, so, she didn't perceive it. Well, here's what I would like to propose uh, just as a kind of a cool – sort of try it out experiment. I know you've got a bunch of people in your office that, that you work with. You know, you, you should just have a bunch of people test uh, their, their 
their cortical metrics, right? I mean, you can. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm definitely gonna, I'm definitely gonna start using this myself, and I'm gonna start recommending it to people. I think it's a really solid tool. Um, definitely, you know, as a base to to really uh, because I, you know, to, to determine how your neurological function is doing. I don't think, yeah, you know, and also I'm I'm happy that it's cheaper. Like, um, marketing advice that's like I, I remember it used to be like a thousand dollars, fifteen hundred. Once you get into the thousand dollar range. It starts to get out of, um, you know, it starts to get a little too pricey for people. I'm, well, here's the thing. The technology is actually better and better and better every year. So we're making it better and less expensive. So we're not and less expensive, yeah. So at this price point, I really think that, you know, if you could figure out what's working for you, it could save you thousands of dollars on equipment and supplements. And like, you know, again, I'm asked all the time, oh, how do I know ISIS is going to work for me, this, that. I said, I don't know, <laughs> where do I put it on my brain? I have no, like, I can't tell each individual. I mean, like, maybe I'd have a better idea if I took a really comprehensive, uh, you know, uh, like, questionnaire on everything that's going on. I spent five hours with them. But the answer is, like, I get a random comment on the website or, or an email or whatever, and I'm just like, listen, you got to just test it out and see how it is. And, and, and I think that it's very hard to do that. But if you have this device then you know exactly what it's doing for you and what it's not. And if it's not helping you, then that's not your treatment. If it is, that's, that's then great. Right. That's exactly then, right. And, no. Yeah, you might not notice it, but you, you should know that your results are getting better. Yes, that's precisely correct. And we're trying, and this is a really big reach, and I'm not sure we'll ever get there, but we're trying to look at this complexing of the somatosensory cortex with perception and pain. And we're trying to actually get a really good measurement of pain because it turns out there's no good way to measure pain. You just have to take people's word for it, right? They might. That's a, a really good point. That's and a really so good point. Actually, we think we can actually start teasing out like what the crossover is in the brain, so that people are feeling pathologic pain. And this is one. It's going to take me. You know, this is a lot of work. It's big science. I shouldn't even say, be saying this, but this is kind of what we're doing. So, so I think that if you. Um, if you can start to have people in a self-hacking community start to use this thing and we start to get feedback, it's going to make it much better for us to improve the device. And of course, all these improvements, most of them firmware, you just get for free. You know, once you buy the device, it's just updates, right? But the other thing is, is that if you've got a big enough community of people uh, using this, that when you actually go to develop those digital tools that you're talking about, you'll already know how people use this. You already know the kind of information you have. You already have sort of a data pool that you can start Plugging oh, in. 100, yeah, a hundred percent. That's why I think definitely it's good. As time goes on, we're going to try to obviously help that along the way so that we could predict who's going to do better with what. And that's our goal. That's our, that's our big mission. But right now, I mean, just having this device, I think is, is, is going to be really important for any kind of brain hacker or self hacker. Well, the other thing is we'd be delighted to, from time to time, you know, just if you have people who have questions about it, specific questions, either Mark or I or both of us, you know, once people started using it, we're perfectly happy to sit down in front of the camera and, and have uh, somebody from your office or you just ask us questions and we'll give, we'll give. Definitely. Story. Yeah. I, I think that's a great okay. idea. I think that's a great idea. So you mentioned some kind of uh, discount. Um, you yeah. know, we don't know exactly what it's going to be yet. Is that what it is? Uh, I think uh, I think it would be uh, at, you know at least ten percent and probably more, but it's going to come down to like we'll need to talk to to, to you guys. Um, we'd like to do this exclusively with self hacked, right? So that so okay. that you know, the best possible and anybody who's interested in this because neurohacking, as you know, is really trending up, right? So we want to be like a magnet for everybody who's doing this in one place. Yeah, that, that, sounds, that, sounds really that sounds really great. That sounds really great. So, yeah, I guess they'll use – for now, we, we haven't I, – I, I haven't uh, – I don't think I've – I don't think anyone from my team has discussed this. But for now, we could say uh, they could use a coupon code self-hacked and they'll get uh, a discount probably around 10% or what, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, it'd, it'd be sort of like, you know, it'd be sort of like 50 and 50. It'd be exactly the way we set it up with Nata for the MicroPulse earlier, right? Okay. Um, I talked to my colleague, so he and I make both the de de decisions for cortical metrics. I'm the final decision maker for MicroPulse, but Mark and okay, I. Okay, so yeah, so um, type in a coupon code self hacked and you'll get yeah. some kind of discount, whether it's $50 or whatever it is. Um, we'll have to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, and then. Well, you can actually and write it, and you can, you know, we, we can solidify it, and then there might be times where we've actually improved the manufacturing. 
so we can give you know a better discount. That yeah, the more the more devices that that uh, Dr. Dennis sells, essentially the cheaper the manufacturing is, and uh, so that's why I think you know it's our community is getting uh, larger every day. I mean, like we we keep on getting uh, increases in traffic. Uh, the the most recent month was over two million people, which is actually the largest, uh, the most traffic website when it comes to biohacking. A whole bunch of we actually just. Um, uh, when it comes to nutrition, we actually just uh, we have about the same amount of traffic as Examine, which is the number one side of nutrition. Yes, so yes. we we kind of tied with them. We right. surpassed all the paleo sites, uh, Bulletproof, whatever, all these all these sites. Uh, well, we we massively surpassed the traffic. When it comes to neurohacking, which is big and growing fast, there's no. Oh yeah, we're definitely the number hacking. one for when it comes to neurohacking. No and question. Neurohack should should be firmly established, and I think with this kind of a tool. There's just no way for anybody else to compete. They just don't, won't have the tool. We just won't work with them. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I think well, this is going to be great. Thing, 